Let's take our Bibles this morning to the book of Isaiah, chapter 60, verse 1. When I was in uh, Bible college, uh, I was told uh, that, uh, you know, when you read your Bible, uh, you know, when you're in the ministry, uh, don't read it with a pad and pen and try to get a sermon while you're reading. You read it for your own edification. And I felt, as I tried that, you know, the first church I took was in an agricultural area. Um, it's like telling a cow, stand by a bale of hay, don't eat it. Because, you, you know, you read and thoughts come, and you can't help but uh, do it. And I got a little box at home. I uh, learned this uh, from a mentor of mine, a dear pastor friend of mine, uh, Dr. Ken Conley, uh, in California. He's gone home to be with the Lord now. But he had a little box that had sermon seeds. And so when you, you know, go on a passage, I would, you know, if an outline came, I would write it down, fold up the paper, put it in the box. And then if you're stuck, I can pull out some papers and, and do that. But last night we looked at Daniel 2. This is another uh, Old Testament passage. Uh, Isaiah 60, verse 1, and, uh, and as I was reading through the book of Isaiah, uh, this just flashed out of the page, and immediately I wrote down an outline and some thoughts. It's a wonderful verse. It says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. And I thought, boy, there could be no greater Christmas message than this. Arise, shine, for your light has come. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you. And Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our peace, as Rich said, he is our hope. We thank you, Father that as Christian people who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, who have acknowledged their sin and their offense before God and repented of sin and put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we thank you and we are so grateful and so humble that our hope is not in man, not in this world. There's so many around us who are hoping that this world would become a better place, that man would find an answer to all the ills and problems of society. We thank you, Father, that our hope is not in some program or some legislation, but our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is in a person, the almighty Christ, the eternal Christ. And we look forward to that day when we stand with him in eternity and there's a new heaven and a new earth and the old things are passed away and behold, all things have become new. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. This morning, I'd like to just bring you some simple things to remind you the importance of today. Why do we celebrate uh, Christmas, and why do we worship the Lord Jesus Christ on a day like today? Uh, you, to me, this is the greatest uh, event in human history. We divide our calendar by this day. We divide B.C. before Christ and then it is A.D., Adon, Adonai, uh, in the year of our Lord, Anno Domini. Uh, our whole dating system changes because of the day on which the Lord Jesus Christ was born. Isaiah was, to me, the greatest prophet uh, in the Old Testament. He wrote 700 years before Christ. There are two amazing prophecies about Christ in the book of Isaiah. 
and they're very familiar to us. One is in Isaiah 7, 14, that, uh, that, uh, that a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And then, as we read this morning, Isaiah 9, 6, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Isaiah, let me give you a little trivia about the book of Isaiah. Uh, there are 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah. Uh, how many chapters or how many books are there in the Bible? 66. Okay, in the Old Testament, how many books are there? 39. How many in the New? 27. That comes to 66. When you come to the book of Isaiah, there is such a dramatic shift and change in this book. In the first uh, chapters, uh, 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 chapters uh, 1 to 39, Isaiah centers upon the judgment of God, the wrath of God, upon the children of Israel for their disobedience, for their sin. And there, the, there's the looming threat of judgment of the Assyrians coming to take them captive. But then in chapter 40 to 46, there is a complete shift, a complete change. And it is the grace of God where Israel is restored, find favor in God. So that in the, in the Bible, there's 39 books in the Old Testament that emphasize law. There are 27 books in the New Testament that emphasize uh, grace. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 1 to 39, emphasizes law and holiness and judgment. From chapter 40 to 46, it emphasizes grace and mercy, the, the, the restoration of Israel and the future and coming glory of Israel. It is such a distinct shift that when the higher critics got a hold of the book of Isaiah, they said, this book cannot be written by one individual only. There's such a difference in tone and nature in the book of Isaiah that there must be two authors. Do, uh, and so there's this, the higher critics and higher criticism try to destroy this beautiful book of Isaiah the prophet. The verse that we want to consider this morning, in chapter 60, verse 1, falls in this area of the restoration and future glory of Israel. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Your light has come. Now we know in the New Testament, especially in the book of John, primarily, the Lord Jesus Christ is often referred as light. In John 1, 4, he is the light of men. In John 1, 9, he is the true light. In John 3, 19, he is the light that has come into the world. In John 8, verse 12, and John 9, verse 5, he, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. In John 12, verse 46, Jesus says, I am come as a light into the world. There is this symbolism in the writings of John of light and darkness. Uh, light uh, that represents insight and truth and knowledge, understanding, darkness of ignorance and groping. And so as we look at this, your light has come. I want us to, to think about the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your light has come. And we want to think, first of all, in the sense of that he was born in obscurity. What are the attending circumstances of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ as he came to this earth, that the eternal word became flesh and dwelt among us? He was born in obscurity. The second thing we want to look at is that he lived in humility. We want to look at this lowly individual. You know, take my yoke upon you, for I am meek and lowly of heart. Uh, 
And then the third thing is we want to stress the purpose. Why did he come? And that is to die vicariously for us. So let's look at this. He was born in obscurity. So we think about the eternal Son of God who has come into this world. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. That God was manifested in the flesh. Now when we think about this greatest event in human history, we ask ourselves, how did the eternal Son of God come into this world? How did the blessed Son of God come into this world? How did the second person of the eternal Godhead come into this world? What are the attending circumstances of his birth? How did he come into this world? Well, we know this, that Christ did not suddenly appear on the scene uh, as an adult. But he was conceived in the womb of Mary miraculously by the Holy Spirit of God. And in the womb of Mary, there was nine months of gestation. And Jesus had a normal and a natural birth. But then you think, what are the attending circumstances in his birth? How did God do it? Because the thing that God did is so completely different than how man would ever do it. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 19, or it is that, that, the, 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 that the, the wisdom of man is foolishness unto God. Now, if man were to bring in this person, the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, how would they introduce this one into the world? Well, certainly, you, when you think about the wise of this world, they love pomp and pride. That he would have been born, if it was up to the wise of this world, he would have been born perhaps in Rome, the capital city of the Roman Empire. He would have been born in a palace. He would have been born of a, into a position, family, of power and authority of wealth, or maybe if the wise of this world did it, he would have been born in Jerusalem, the capital city of Israel. He, he would have been born of a prominent family, maybe a leading Pharisee. Maybe he would have been immediately accepted and praised and anointed as king. You see, if this world would have done it, there would have been display and show. There would have been pomp. Uh, that's all associated with the wisdom and the wise of this world. But how did God in his wisdom bring about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ? How did God do it? Well, here is the great difference between how God does things and how man does things. See, God did not choose someone of rank of this world, of social standing or social dignity. What did God do? He called a humble couple, Mary and Joseph, lowly. Not much in regard to the things of this world. Not very wealthy. Joseph was a carpenter. Mary, a girl. And this is how God did it. They lived in an insignificant, unimportant village of Nazareth. And that is where the angel of the Lord appeared to both Mary and Joseph. But you, we know this, that the scripture tells us in Micah 5, 2, that the Lord is supposed to be born in Bethlehem. But here is Mary and Joseph, they live in Nazareth. So how are they going to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem? Well, it's no problem for God. You see, I think, I truly believe God put it in the heart of Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed and everyone go back to their land of nativity and, and there to be sent, uh, there's a census taken, so there's taxation. And this meant for Mary and Joseph to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem. 
And the, it was a 90-mile uh, journey. And I keep in mind that Mary was near the point of delivering the Lord Jesus Christ, giving birth to the Savior. And they would travel on a donkey, walking this distance of 90 miles. And in Mary, in her condition, I'm sure they could not travel very fast. They got to, to Bethlehem, and they found as they got to Bethlehem, the town was already crowded. Luke tells us in Luke chapter 2, verse 7, that, that when Jesus was born, he was wrapped in swaddling clothes and lie in a manger. And that word manger is a stall or a trough. It's for feeding of animals. In the second part of Luke 2, verse 7, Luke tells us why the Lord Jesus Christ was born this way. Why was he laid in a manger? You know, there could have been a cave where he was born, animals around. Why was he born in, under these circumstances? Well, Luke tells us because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, Chuck Swindoll, he's got a wonderful commentary in the book, uh, the Gospel of Luke, and he tells us in this commentary that in our Western mind, when you read, there was no room for them in the inn, we should not think of Motel 6. <laughs> you, know, it, it, you know, that's what we immediately think of when we read that word inn. But that word inn, Cataluma, it means a resting place or a stopping place. It's a guest chamber or a lodging place. It is basically one large room. Uh, in Luke chapter 22, verse 11, when the Lord Jesus Christ was to have the last supper with his disciples, they went into a guest chamber or a guest room. And it's the same word, Cataluma. In Acts chapter 1, verse 13, the 120 disciples who watched and witnessed the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord Jesus told them, go back to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit of God. They met there in an upper room. And in all probability, it was something like an attic. It was the uppermost room of a house, open, without walls, to divide the space. And there, the 120 met. Uh, waiting for uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit. So the, you would think, think of a big room in which crowded with people as they tried to find a place on the floor to sleep and to rest during this time in Bethlehem. And what is so striking is here is Mary. They come into Jerusalem and everyone, it's obvious that she is about to deliver a child. And no one says, why don't you take my place or my space? But they're forced out. And there they have the Lord Jesus Christ is born. Born shrouded in obscurity. Now you think of this. Here's the greatest event in human history. God becoming flesh. The eternal Son of God coming out of heaven to this earth shrouded as a little baby. What was the topic of conversation in Bethlehem? Was it the birth of the Son of God? Was it the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the long-awaited Messiah and Savior of Israel? No. The topic, I'm sure, was this, was taxes and taxation and government and government rule and resentment. Now, you look at the conversation today, and nothing has changed. What are people talking about on this day in which we honor and celebrate the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to this earth? People are talking about taxes and government, inconvenience, the imposition of government on us. They don't talk about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not going to hear on the news, you know, a breaking story of a baby born in Bethlehem. No. 
the vast, what is so sad is the vast majority of the people on this earth have no idea what today is. They talk about other things that have no meaning or significance when it comes to eternity. The greatest event in all of human history is shrouded in obscurity. A little baby born in a cave put in a manger because no one had compassion on a girl who was pregnant and obviously ready to be delivered. Born in obscurity. The second thing we want to think about the Lord Jesus Christ is that this one, the Son of God, lived in complete humility. In Philippians 2, verse 8, there the Apostle Paul, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he humbled himself. It's in the active voice. He humbled himself. It was something he did willingly, voluntarily. He humbled himself. He came out of heaven. He came out of glory. He came from the presence of God and the presence of the angel, and he came to this earth veiled in human flesh. He humbled himself. That word humble means to be to make low, to become poor, to become someone of low degree. This is what the Apostle Paul said about the Lord Jesus Christ in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he were rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, abject poverty. He became poor. He humbled himself. He became poor that we through his poverty might become rich, abounding in wealth. He lived in humility. It means that Jesus, during the days of his flesh, lived in complete dependence upon God, in complete obedience to God. Now, when we think about the life of the Lord Jesus Christ on this earth, we know that he lived approximately 33 years, maybe 33 and a half years. But we normally think of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, do we not? Of the three years of his ministry, of the miracles and the teaching. But let's think a minute. Where was he the first 30 years of his life? What was he doing? 90% of his life was lived before he showed himself in public. And John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. What was he doing? We have one glimpse in the Gospel of Luke at the Lord Jesus at 12 years of age in the temple teaching the doctors of the law, and they were so amazed at this one teaching them. That's the only glimpse from birth to 12, nothing. From 12 to 30, nothing. But I think we have some insight. If we turn to the book of Luke and the book of Mark, there are, if we compare and contrast five verses of Scripture, I think we can get an insight into those 30 years of silence of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you have come to the Gospel of Luke, the, the the three are in Luke 2 and two are in Mark chapter 1. So you look at Luke 2 verse 40. It says, and the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And then Luke 2 verse 51. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. Subject to them. Now keep in mind that he is subject to Mary and Joseph. Keep in mind who the Lord Jesus Christ is. He is the Son of God. The eternal Christ. He subjected, 
put himself in subjection to Mary and Joseph. That word he, he was subject to them is a military term. It means to put in order of rank. Now, if you've been in the military, you know that if you, you, you have a certain rate or rank, anyone above you, you are in subjection to them. You have to obey what they say. Now, this is the idea of this word. He was subject to them. He, he arrayed, arranged himself. He placed himself under the authority of Mary and Joseph. He became subject to them. He became subordinate to them. He obeyed them. And then the next verse is Luke 2, verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And then the next one is at his baptism. In Mark 1, 11, this is where the voice comes. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then the last one, Mark 6, 3, is this not the carpenter? Now, we compare and contrast these five verses, and what can we summarize about the life of the Lord Jesus Christ? The first is in regard to man, in his relationship to man in Mark 6, 3. Is this not the carpenter? Now, that opens a big window into the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when, when this... When this statement was made, is this not the carpenter? It was not a compliment. No, it was filled with contempt. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ had such wisdom and knowledge in his teaching. People marveled at his teaching. No one ever spoke like this man speaks. And out of contempt, he never went to a school of the Pharisees. He didn't have a degree. He, he didn't hang around with the notable Pharisees. It was said in contempt, is this not the carpenter? What does this tell us about the Lord Jesus Christ? That he learned a trade from Joseph. Joseph was a carpenter. So the years that the Lord Jesus Christ was growing up in Nazareth, he was subject unto them. He arrayed himself under their authority. And can we ever grasp this? The one that created the trees had to learn a trade of carpentry. How do you explain that? He grew in wisdom. How do you explain that? The infinite, all-wise God. But that's what he did. He learned a trade from Joseph. And in those years of, of, of humility that he lived, here he was. He made tables and chairs and beds and yokes. Is this not the carpenter? And I wonder how many of those people that made this con contemptible statement against Christ maybe sat in a chair he made or laid in a bed he made ate at a table he made. Is this not the carpenter? Now, that's in relation to man, but what about his relation to God? In Luke 2, 40, the grace of God was upon him. In Luke 2, uh, verse 52, Jesus increased in favor with God. In Mark 11, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now here again is a great window into those 30 years of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. What was the Lord Jesus Christ doing in those 30 years? He was living a life that was pleasing to God. He was living in obedience to God. This is my beloved son. Now, this voice came at his baptism. It came again in Matthew 17 in the Mount of Transfiguration. But the first utterance of these words came at his baptism. Now, keep in mind, at his baptism, he is just entering into public ministry, into the public sphere. 
He has not yet defeated the devil in the wilderness. He has not yet lived a life of obedience to God, of sinlessness and holiness. Before the cross, before Gethsemane, before the resurrection, before the ascension, before Christ ever started out in his public ministry, he is concluding 30 years in Nazareth, beginning a life of public ministry. And the voice from heaven says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. What does that tell us? What are the conclusions? He lived a life that was pleasing to God those 30 years. There's not a word written about those years. But just by that utterance, we know something. He had a life that was pleasing to God. He lived in obedience to God. That is his life of, uh, uh, of humility. He lived his life in humility. He humbled himself. And then last, he died vicariously. This addresses uh, the purpose of his coming to this earth. Why did he come to this earth? Why was he born? What's the purpose of the incarnation? In Luke 2, verse 11, that we've read over this Christmas season, you remember the angels said to the shepherds who were watching their flocks by night, and they said to the shepherds, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. A Savior, one who saves, one who delivers. As I said, light is used in Scripture for enlightenment, under, getting understanding. You see, in darkness, we have no knowledge of our condition before God. We are completely ignorant of our condition and our standing before God. We are lost and we are undone. We are enslaved in sin. We face the judgment for our sin. But then the light comes and there's a new awareness. This is what the Holy Spirit of God does. It brings the light of the gospel to our heart, to our mind. We don't get that by uh, uh, reasoning or deduction, logic. No, it, it is a revelation of the Spirit of God to us. It brings conviction. We are in sin. We are under the judgment of God. And what does that do? It causes us to flee to Christ to come to Christ. The Holy Spirit helps us to realize, makes us to realize that our only hope and our only help is to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other means and no other method by which God saves sinners, but that through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he came. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, that this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world. That's the incarnation, the advent, the appearing, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now, when you come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and you feel the condemnation of your sin by the Holy Spirit of God, there can be no greater news to you but that there has been a gift offered to you through the Lord Jesus Christ that he died for you. He died in your place. He died vicariously. That he was delivered up for us in our place, in our stead, so that when we look at the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, there is a transaction going on between uh, God and the Lord Jesus. Jesus is paying for our sin and our judgment and our guilt. He has satisfied the law of God by his perfect life. He is satisfying the justice of God by his death so that God can be both just 
and the justifier of those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. See, that's why he came. That's why we celebrate Christmas. That's why Christmas ought to be such a joy to our heart. It's more than just another day. It's the day that we observe the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. He came to save me. He came for me. There's no greater news than that on Christmas morning. The Savior has come. Your light has come. And the glory of the Lord shines upon you. What is better in this life? Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you. And, oh, Father, we thank you for your grace to us, your infinite mercy, your infinite compassion, your infinite tenderness, that you would look upon us in loving compassion. We are in our plight, the plight of sin. We are under the judgment for our sin, headed for a Christless eternity, separated from God facing torment forever. Oh, but God looked upon the offending sinner. We have offended God. We have sinned against God with no regard. And he made an offering for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, may this Christmas day bring more meaning to us than ever before, that I am an object of the love of God, and I am one for whom Christ died. What a gift, indescribable, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.